The Association of the United States Army is pleased to welcome you to AUSA's Thought Leaders webinar series. A webinar series featuring contemporary military authors and military leaders. Kicking off today's webinar is AUSA's Vice President of Membership and Meetings, Brigadier General Jack Haley. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Association of the United States Army's Thought Leaders webinar. Thank you for joining us today and we appreciate your support as partners in the defense of our nation. I've just recently joined the AUSA team and am honored to be hosting today's tremendous panel of warrant officers. And if you didn't know, the warrant officer cohort celebrates its 103rd birthday tomorrow, July 9th. Since 1918, the Army has relied on warrant officers to train soldiers, advise commanders on missions, and specialize within specific areas such as intelligence, aviation, logistics, or military police. The Army's technical experts, happy birthday. We are pleased to have joining us today, CW5 Rick Knowlton, CW5 Patrick Nelligan, CW5 Teresa Domeyer, and CW5 Jonathan Yerby. In addition, we have CW5 Yolandria Dixon Carter to provide opening remarks, and our very own CW5 Phyllis Wilson, U.S. Army retired, AUSA Senior Fellow and a member of the AUSA Board of Directors who will moderate the webinar. For those of us joining online today, please take advantage of having the panelists here to ask questions. You can use the Q&A tab on the right side of your screen to submit a question. After the discussion, we will take as many questions as possible. You can also find the full bios of each panelist in the handouts tab. Chief Wilson, thank you for joining us and for moderating this discussion. Thank you so much, sir. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. What promises we hope to be a very fascinating and insightful discussion, we'll kick off today's discussion with a few opening remarks from Chief Dixon Carter. CW5 Yolandria Dixon Carter is currently serving as the Assistant Executive Officer and Senior Warrant Officer Advisor to the Chief of Staff of the Army. In her role as Senior Warrant Officer Advisor, she chairs the Army Warrant Officer Council, which advises the CSA and other senior Army leaders on current and future development of the Warrant Officer Cohort. We are so pleased and delighted to hear a few opening remarks from my friend and mentor, Chief DC. Thank you, General Haley, and thank you, Chief Wilson. Thank you. She's more of my mentor than I am her mentor, <laughs> but we will share. Um, it's really an exciting day. Good afternoon to each and every one of you and a happy Thursday. It is the day before the Warren Officer Cohart's 103rd birthday, and I am truly excited about what tomorrow is going to bring, but we need to start with today, right? So, it was July 1918 when the first warrant officers were sanctioned. There were about 40 warrant officers and they shared one branch and one grade. They were specialized in army mine planners and they were a part of the, the field artillery corps. And they were known as experts then and today we are known as experts. But not only are we experts today, but today we stand approximately 27,000 strong leaders, combat operators, technicians, trainers, advisors, experts, and experienced warrant officers across three compos and 17 branches. I am incredibly proud of what we as a warrant officer cohort, what we're doing, but more importantly, what you out there, what you're doing each and every day to make a difference in our army. So as we prepare to celebrate 103 years of warrant officer history, I want to thank AUSA for the opportunity to bring some of our superstars together to discuss the warrant officer cohort's greatness across all of our compos and to discuss talent management and all of the great things that Forces Command One Officers are doing. So we invite you to join us to share this webinar with a friend and get ready for a great and fruitful discussion. And at the end, you get to ask questions. So 
I'm excited. I want you to be excited. Our panel of superstars are excited. So I'm going to get out of the way so you can get on your way to a very exciting day. Thank you. As always, DC gets us all fired up, doesn't she? She's the best cheerleader. And I just want to point out, many of you know, but as she pointed out, 27,000 warrant officers in an army of a million plus. We're not many, but we make an incredible difference. And we're going to start with one gentleman that already has made a huge difference and continues to do so. CW5 Rick Knowlton is currently serving as the Senior Warrant Officer Advisor for Army Talent Management Task Force. He has previously served as the Chief of Aviation Warrant Officer Assignments at U.S. Army Human Resources Command and the Command Chief Warrant Officer of the 1st Air Cavalry Brigade at Fort Hood, Texas. Chief Knowlton, you're up. Thanks, ma'am. And Thanks AUSA, the whole team for uh, providing this opportunity for us to talk warrant officer topics and uh, from the Army's Taliban Management Task Force, we thank you for this opportunity as well. So quickly in the first five minutes, I'm just gonna cover briefly the nine initiatives that we're working on at the team. And then later on, obviously we can go back and talk about any of the things uh, with questions. So the first three that I wanna talk about are all at the legislative level. Two of them are proposals that we've submitted last year. That would be merit-based promo uh, promotions and the opt-out promotion. And this is to align us with the 2019 NDA that the commission officers were provided with. Um, an update to that is uh, we were hoping to have that in the FY22. Uh, it was put on hold during the transition in December. The good news is it, it has been resubmitted for the 23, uh, FY process. So we're working our way through that uh, this summer to ensure that we have that opportunity in the future. The third legislative uh, discussion that's going on is the Title 10. And specifically, uh, you, you probably heard about the study. This is looking at the gaps in talent management in warrant officers. We recognize where they land in Title 10. And what we're wanting to do is uh, propose the idea of delegation of authority to the secretary concerned. So in other words, our army secretary having the ability to uh, improve and change our uh, talent management uh, level Title 10 type of uh, uh, legislation. So that's something we're just in the discussion with. And the, 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 the real modus behind that is, is we've not seen a lot of change for us over the past 30 years. We are different than the other services, and this is the ability or affords each service secretary to manage us the way that we need to be managed. The next thing, uh, the next three are three ADs. Uh, good news about two of those. The first one, the direct commission to CW2, that was piloted by the SF. It was approved in uh, March or correction May, and literally the next day we were able to implement that with a graduation graduating five CW, uh, five of the, their candidates directly to CW2. The next one is the uh, regular Army Warrant Officers uh, Retired to Reserve. That also just got approved. That opens the door. And I, and I put it that way because it's just the beginning of a developing process that will allow those regular Army Warrant Officers that have retired or are recently about to retire to have that opportunity to look at either serving, continuing to serve in the Guard or Reserve. The next one is our is our W1, and it's, this is a pilot with aviation and specifically the aviators. Uh, and this is looking at 24 uh, months time and grade from the time that they are MOS qualified. And the reason behind that one specifically is we are seeing the length of the uh, technical and tactical uh, training and proficiency required. And this just allows for that developmental time as a W1. The next one is expansion of competitive categories, and, and what we're looking at doing here is currently, as you all know, we are uh, a category of aviation and the rest. The rest obviously being text, but I say it that way because it's fine for aviation to have uh, their, their OML, their strength be compared to one another, but it's an entirely different thing to have every other branch be competitive uh, with each other, uh, so, you know, where, where you have SF and ADA and uh, logistics compared to uh, everybody else. And we, we really think we could benefit from opening that up to the potential COE type branches where you have nine, uh, nine categories. The next one uh, is a selective continuation. 
This is something that's obviously not popular. I think we need to relook at how we implement that. We need to get more granular in, uh, in who we are, are saving, at the, at the, especially at the W4 level, because we're losing a lot of great talent at that level. And then at the same time, how we notify those individuals, because after being passed over the first time, that the holding your breath for that whole entire next year, we're seeing great talent that just wants to avoid that limbo gets out when we actually could have told them that they were, they were going to have a job, whether they get promoted yet or not, we don't know, but to be in that critical short list of folks that are eligible for CELCON, it would be good for them to know they at least have a job. And then, uh, the next one is, the, and this one's relatively new for us, and that's the Warrant Officer Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. This is a supporting project inclusion. This is something that we've kicked off here recently in the spring. And what we're doing is basically wanting to operationalize the Army People Strategy and the DE&I Annex. And with that, I think I've, I've used up my full five minutes, so I better hand it back over to Phyllis. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a lot of information. And, and for some of the folks, they may not necessarily be tracking on exactly um, all of those terms, but that's a, a thing that means you have a, a knowledge deficit in some of those areas. I certainly did as a W1 through W3. It was not until I was fairly late in my lifetime as a W4 and into W5 before I understood some of what he's now talking about. So just, uh, just know that it's out there and there are opportunities for us to serve at incredible levels. So thank you again. Next up, CW5 Patrick Nelligan. He's currently serving, he's newly serving as the Command Chief Warrant Officer of the U.S. Army Reserve Command. In this role, CW5 Nelligan advises his commanding general the headquarters staff and subordinate elements on all matters affecting talent management, professional development, and quality of life for Army Reserve and beyond warrant officers. So Chief Nelligan, it's to you. Thank you, Phyllis. And uh, great to be here with this high powered team. I'd like to hit a couple of vignettes from the Army Reserve perspective. So as we turn 103 years old as a cohort, the Army Reserve turned 113 in April. So by, by uh, default, that makes us the youngest of the components on the call today. Um, not by my age, but by, by the Army Reserve. But this is what we've learned um, since we've had warrants in our formation. We're incredibly versatile. We're incredibly uh, valuable. The best warrant officer formations are the ones that warrant officers care about other warrants. We for the most part are dual career professionals. We have civilian jobs that we've been able to broker those skill sets into our reserve jobs and vice versa. And people like me that have stayed for almost 40 years, um, I, I completely attribute, completely attribute the success in both arenas to being an army soldier and reservist. So the segue I would like to bring up today, uh, specific to how we're broadcasting this message is, as Mr. Knowlton had pointed out, we're, we're looking at something uh, for the first time in 30 years that involves technical proficiency throughout the, the full spectrum of our, our uh, life cycle. But more importantly, how we set ourselves up to be relevant to the future Army requirements, but starting today. So as those of you that are watching are either in our formation retired from our formation or perhaps considering coming in, it's an exciting time to go warrant and to be a warrant. And for those of you that retired, I would, I would appeal to you to keep involved with us because the lessons you learned that you went out the door with, we would benefit from hearing, even though the, the tempo is changing, the world is changing. Um, there's still bad guys. They still um, of the model. We can't do it if we keep making the same mistakes over and over. You can help us with that. And to any of you that are listening today that want to go warrant, it's the most rewarding career that you could uh, consider. And as I've often um, repeated over and over, it's not just a rank, it's an identity. Every one of us calls ourselves chief. It's a term of endearment. It's a very select few, 27,000 plus. You have to work hard to become one of us. 
but we want you in and we will make sure you stay a long time. So with that, Phyllis, I'll turn it back over to you. And, and again, thank you for the opportunity. Thanks so very much, Pat. Uh, I just have to tell you, I'm so proud to see him um, I am an Army Reserve soldier for life as well. And to see Patrick Nelligan as our newest Command Chief Warrant Officer, I'm extremely happy. And I will tell you, I feel like I had a little part to play in ensuring he made uh, W-5. So thank you, Pat, for what you do for us. Next up, CW-5, Teresa Domeyer. She's currently serving as the Command Chief Warrant Officer of Compo 2, the Army National Guard. In this role, CW5 Domeyer advises the director of the Army National Guard on all matters pertaining to policies, programs, and actions concerning the warrant officer cohort across the Guard. CW5 Domeyer previously served as the command chief warrant officer from the great state of Nebraska. <laughs> Teresa, to you. Thank you, Phyllis. And thank you, AUSA. Uh, I would like to talk about five things and my priorities are the same as the director for the first three, and it's people, readiness, and modernization. And people matter. You know, we, we're thinking this Army directive is great because working with Rick Nol Knowlton and Pat on this has really been an experience, and I, I think the National Guard is going to benefit, just like the Army Reserves, by taking these talented um, active Army personnel to come in and join our ranks. And there's also other opportunities in the full-time spectrum as the technicians, you know, Title 32, Title 5 that we'll probably get into later, but it's a it's a great opportunity and you know to talk about. And then readiness with um, the readiness with training our uh, combat, you know, the the warrant officers are the combat multipliers. And so we wanna make sure that we all train and with the modernization on, on equipment of the newest with all three compos together. So I think it's very, very important that we all talk about, you know, the future of changing the PME and making it better for our up and coming uh, senior warrant officers, because it's not about us anymore. It's about our future leaders and we want to make it better. The fourth thing I want to talk about is our RTI programs. We have 27 states that have phase one and train it once a month for five months for the RTI. And then we have two right now, uh, two phase two sites and it's Camp Atterbury, Indiana, and they do two straight full weeks. Um, and we have certain states that feed into each site. So it's Camp Atterbury and then Fort McClellan, um, Alabama. Right now, uh, we are looking at putting a third site in. And so the director is waiting for a briefing from the G3. And we have four states that are interested, which is California, Arizona, Idaho, and Washington. They've all been visited and they're, they're trying to see the best cost effective um, state to do a phase three sites or phase two sites. So we're excited. Hopefully we will do a small um, phase two site for the, whatever location is picked um, for 20, 2022. And then the last thing I wanna talk about is IPSE. All 54, 50 states, three territories in the District of Columbia, we are all on IPSE. And it's important that we work together with COMPO 1 and 3 to ensure there's a easy transition and that there's if there's any kind of problems, we are there. We have a great team of experts in IPSE. So we are here to work as one team, one fight to ensure that we will all be on one system soon. Back to you, Phyllis. Thanks so much. And I'm gonna do a couple of points of clarification because I used to have to do it a lot. RTI, Reg Regional Training Institutes. And she's talking about phase one and phase two of Warrant Officer Candidate School. Just to be clear which program she's addressing with regards to, uh, I've been to many of those graduations, um, certainly from each of the states where they might only have five or 10 students, and also then where they have the large ones at Camp Atterbury in particular, where there might be 
nearly 200 students graduating, typically from the Guard and the Reserve. Um, but what we would love to see, honestly, from my own personal opinion, I'd love to see some regular Army Compo 1 soldiers going through as well, because it is identical. It is overseen completely by the Warren Officer Career College and uh, First Walk down at Fort Rucker, Alabama, which we all love so very much. So next up and last up before we go to the Q&A session is CW5 Jonathan Yerby. He is currently the Senior Warrant Officer Advisor for United States Army Forces Command. Chief Yerby's most recent assignment was as the 6th Command Chief Warrant Officer for Combined Arms Support Command, CASCOM, at Fort Lee, Virginia. And prior to that assignment, he was the 14th Regimental Chief Warrant Officer of the Quartermaster Corps, Fort Lee, Virginia. Chief Yerby, take it over. Thank you, Phyllis. Before getting started, I'd like to say what an honor it is to participate on a panel with such distinguished leaders. Also, I'd like to thank you, AUSA for holding the Thought Leaders webinar series and hosting a warrant officer panel on the eve of our 103rd birthday. I'm humbly grateful for everything that AUSA does for our soldiers, civilians, and family members. And also thank you, uh, Brigadier General Haley, for uh, hosting today's event. So let me start with a little bit about where I serve. ForceCom is the largest United States Army command and provider of expeditionary, regionally engaged, campaign-capable land forces to combatant commanders. Forces Command trains and prepares a combat-ready, globally responsive total force in order to build and sustain readiness to meet combat combatant commander requirements. The vision of Forces Command is to provide combat ready and globally responsive total army forces that are well led, disciplined, trained, and expeditionary that will win in a complex, in a complex environment. So briefly, I wanna go over Freedom Sixes, our CG's priorities. They should not be of any surprise to anyone because they are in line with the Army's priorities. Number one, people. Number two, readiness. Number three, modernization. But the line of efforts that we're getting after for the people priority is care of, for soldiers, civilians, and families, and strengthening leader development. That's, that's what we're doing here today. Uh, readiness, deliver decisive total Army readiness, and master the fundamentals. That, 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 that's, that's what a warrant officer does uh, in a nutshell right there. Um, and number three, modernization. Empower and execute reform, inform and implement the future force. To get where we need to be in the future, we must start the journey now. So looking forward to the Army aim points for 2028 and 2035, the Army expects warrant officers to develop deep MOS-centered knowledge, skills, and expertise throughout their careers. Keep pace with modernization and pursue mastery in our technical specialty. As the Army's requirements for technical and tactical experts continue to grow, aligned with the te highly technical nature of Army modernization programs and the evolving capabilities of tactical operations, the development and education of Army warrant officers must keep pace with modernization. The warrant officer education system must modernize to keep pace and not get left behind as an afterthought. The problem is the Army's current continuum of warrant officer professional military education does not provide career long focus on MOS centered expertise. The Army expects warrant officer expertise to continue to develop toward MOS-centered skills and knowledge and mastery throughout the career developmental model. However, warrant officer capabilities, expectations, and even employment drift away from MOS-centered te technical and tactical development towards general staff officer skills at the CW3 level and above. A gap exists between Army leader expectations that senior warrant officers be masters of their technical specialty and up-to-date on the latest technologies and, and capabilities, but the warrant officer education actually shifts at the, at the mid-grade and senior levels to align with general staff officer skills. 
This gap will continue to widen if Warrant Officer PME is not modernized to account for the career long development of the Army's experts in a way that we will keep pace with modernization efforts and in evolving threat capabilities. The goal that I, that I would like to talk about in the question and answer, the goal is to modernize Army's Warrant Officer Professional Military Education for a more effective and efficient continuum of education tailored to MOS-centered technical and tactical expertise that increases learning across various methods of delivery, supports all Army compos, and better meets the personal, functional, and career professional development requirements of the Army Warrant Officers nested with the Army People Strategy. And with that, I'll stop talking and uh, yield some of my time to turn back over to you, Phyllis, for the question and answer portion. Thank you. We all um, can agree with your exactly many of your words there. That was spot on. I know personally, I went back to, uh, I'm an Intel warrant, and I went back to Fort Huachuca, and E4s knew more about my MOS than I knew about my MOS as a W5. And, and that was one of those things where you have to raise your hand and say, but fortunately at this point, I was able to ask for an a la carte menu of the, th the things that I knew I was lacking in and I could get brought up to speed on that again. But that's not f something that's afforded to everybody. And, and I, I agree, I think our PME, I, I'm getting a lot of head nods over here from the panel as well. So Patrick is back as well, Chief Nelligan from um, Army Reserve. So we're gonna go to the question and answer session. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of these that thank you guys. You can go to Q&A and ask more questions at this point, um, but I'm going to start with one that I'm seeing. Is the training for a W-1 aviator, question being asked is, is it now 24 months in, as opposed to a year? And I think obviously Rick can certainly answer that, but a, a quick aside, there are some other MOSs that our training is incredibly long. Yeah. And the problem is, as soon as you graduate from, and now your MOS qualified as a young warrant, you're up for promotion to W-2. Well, you know, you're a wobbly one for a reason, right? right? And so exactly if you'll that. talk about how long the schooling is yep. and why it's important that maybe they get a little bit more time as a one. Absolutely. So to take a, a couple of steps back and I appreciate the question for sure. So the short answer is, is there a 24 month flight training program? No, so I, I'll say that now. Someone might end up taking that long just because of the uh, bubble or something like that, but that has nothing to do with uh, this uh, program. So if we step back in history a little bit um, and think about the difference in progression from a Huey and, and a Cobra to a Black Hawk and to an Apache and the fact that we are continuously getting uh, more te technical and more complicated, I'm just thinking about the checklists and, and the training that's required and then now the mission training that's required, what we're really, we're seeing, and this is came out of uh, uh, a couple of other uh, types of uh, um, inspections or investigations and some uh, over the arching aviation uh, requirements that were being addressed. Uh, there was discussion about just making a flat all across the board three year time and grade requirement. And the reason why that wasn't really the uh, direction that we wanted to go in was simply because again, that's an industrial age approach to managing our warrant officers. And, and just as Phyllis had mentioned, there's, there are MOSs that may actually take more development time. And, and that's aviation is one of those. There are others that are, we're looking at as well that if you're still learning and cannot do the job that you need to do, if you're still in some sort of progression and you're, and you're a W-2, that, that we have a problem with that. That's not where we need to be. And so because we do have techs that roll right out uh, as W-1s, have been doing that their line of work uh, their entire careers, that's different than it is for someone who's completely shifting gears over to an entirely new MOS with, a, with an entirely new mission set. Uh, and they need that time to develop. And that's exactly what this is really getting after. And then I will say on the other side of this too, there's also the reality that there are those folks that are, that want to fly or want to try that and they find and they realize that they can't do it. And now they've been struggling through flight school, they've pinned on W-2 and now they're looking for another branch to continue to serve. And it is harder to ask another branch to accept a W-2 that has no MOS qualification as opposed to someone that is at least still a W-1 that we can let them have a restart uh, in, a, in a new program. 
Thanks. Thank you Good so question. much. I hope that that helped to clear up a few <laughs> muddy waters for you guys. So I see Doug had asked the question. I think I know exactly where that's coming from, but what would be the maximum age for warrant officers to serve in the guard or reserve after a regular army compo one retirement? Does it still stay the same? So, so I, I think this could be answered by more than one of us. Yes. And, and I want the opportunity to just stay. So intentionally what we're not doing when I say we on the task force, we're not prescribing how the two compos are gonna do it because it's gonna be unique to each compo. They have their own set of requirements and it's absolutely up to them to solve how they want to run their program. So uh, we opened the door for, for them. That was what the SEC Army did when she signed uh, uh, this uh, Army directive and now they have the ability to manage it as needed. Thanks, and, and as compo two and three answer this, if you will also, I see another question asking about is there a, a direct pipeline for regular army retirees to go into the AGR? And they say, in, in addition to, I know, but that's, please address that as well as, thank you. So with Compo 2, you know, depending on the needs of the 54, so we're talking about the 50 states, three territories in the District of Columbia, you know, they're going to determine how long they are going to need you. But the age could be 60 or 62 in the guard. You could serve till then, as long as you meet all the requirements and staying up on everything. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's important to let them know that. And AGR, that's that's active guard. I That's not gonna be a choice because then they would have to give up their retirement on that for the active guard. So. But there could be opportunities for as a technician, a GS-5 or, a, you know, a GS-32, no, Title 32, sorry, mm -hmm. Title 5, Title 32. Um, those are opportunities. And, uh, but again, you got to be in the guard to be able to have that opportunity to, to be a mil tech. Okay, you have to get your foot in the door first. Yes, ma'am. Let's clarify. You said yep. GS-5. You don't mean no. any of these warrants are no. going to be looking for a GS-5 I'm job. talking Title V, Title 32, Correct. and you have to apply for those jobs right. just like everybody else does. But it wouldn't be uncommon for them to see a GS-11 or some kind of a job along those right. lines. Right. Yes, ma'am. I just didn't want them to think that we're just going to start you at the very bottom rung no. on the ladder. No. No. It could be a <laughs> GS-11, 12. Just all depends, and and you Correct. can look for those jobs. It's, again, it's still needs of the army, um, whether it's in a civilian sector or you know yes, as a, yes. as an army civilian or wearing an army uniform. Pat, would you like to take a crack at this one, please? Take a crack, Phyllis. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing about Phyllis and I is she's so used to um, picking up on my cues. I shook my head no with the AGR question. She goes yes, but explain. So I'll explain. When you're coming off of active duty um, without retiring, you fall into a different perspective than what mm -hmm. we're talking about that Mr. Knowlton uh, had just briefed. If you've retired from active duty and for whatever reason you have that itch to continue to serve or um, you want to make some extra money, my understanding briefly is you're just going to waive a day of active duty pay retirement to a, way, a, a day of drill pay. The incentives. You could perhaps get promoted to the next level of warrant officer. You can stay longer. And at the end of this second term, those retirement points you earned will give you a better pension the second time around. Those are the benefits for you. Me as Compo 3, I'm about a thousand warrant officers short, mostly W1s and W2s, some W3s and some W5s. Those are aggregate numbers. The goal of recruiting this year is to target recruit for the vacancies <clears throat> by MOS, by grade, and by location. So as we start to look at what this opportunity, and it is a great opportunity, means to Compo 3, we're going to be very specific on, on uh, to whom we would offer this opportunity to based on your skill set, based on your grade, based on your MOS, and where you're willing to be assigned because we're a global force and unlike the National Guard with 54 states and territories, when you come into the Army Reserve, there's formations all over the world, as Phyllis uh, can attest to. So there has to be more of a negotiation and full disclosure and business rules of what coming into our formation as a retiree coming back online means. 
Um, and as far as this, the, uh, the 62 and two or 60, yeah, <clears throat> there's an opportunity to go to that length of time in service. But the other question is, will you want to? And as I said, we're looking for you guys to be much, and gals, to be much more open to the flexibility of following your rank to a different location for assignment, which is something we're not really doing much of now, but the paradigm is shifting. Warrant officers are going to be moving to different assignments in the Army Reserve, and, and these active retirees would be expected to, to fit into that role. Uh, the final piece about AGR, excuse me, <coughs> Teresa hit it on the head. If you come into our formation, you're coming as TPU. We have an AGR program. It's very particular in how you assess into AGR. Your first time out of the gate, you're in a three-year probationary model, and that's not really filling the needs we have in the Army Reserve and strength. We're short TPUs, and that's what we'll be looking for. So I'll turn it back over to you, Phyllis. I hope I covered all of it. Thanks, Ms. Pat. And for those of you that don't know what TPU stands for, that's a troop program unit. That's the, the, the misnomer is it's the one weekend a month, two weeks a year. It's a total fabrication. <laughs> it's much more than that. But that's where we do need. And But we have, a, both in the Guard and Reserve, about 15 to 18% of our formations, some more, some than less, but on average, are AGR. That's your full time. So think of a, 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 a motor pool unit, okay? We have maybe eight or nine people that are there to manage it Monday through Friday. And one weekend a month, Everybody else that belongs to that unit comes in to do all the motor maintenance and everything else that needs to be done. Oh, and by the way, those Army mandatory required trainings and everything else that has to happen all must occur on that one weekend a month. So the balancing act, and that's why those AGRs are so incredibly important to us because they hold down the fort, pun intended, Monday through Friday, and they also work the drill weekends. Um, so they do all of those kind of things. And, and it is a very selective piece. We've got to be the right temperament, the right skill set, the right everything in order for them to cover down. And they also are PCS. So um, it's not like you're gonna sit, sit home and you pick the state, the, the city, whatever it is, and think you're gonna live there for the next 15 years in the Army Reserve or the National Guard. That, that is not always the case. Um, another question that I see, and I thank you General Waff for tuning in. He loves our, our warrant officers. It says, will the U.S. Army Reserve also look at the same nine fields of promotion for the tech branches, which the talent management, which uh, Chief Knowlton mentioned, and how would the different branches be aligned in those nine fields? So before I ask you to answer, Pat, because I've forgotten, give us a couple of what those nine fields are, please, Rick. Yeah, so the thought process behind those nine fields, it's actually quite simple to answer this way. It's the nine centers of excellence. And the idea of it is, is that if you're, if you're expecting specific KSB's requirements for promotion, where are they being trained and brought and developed? And that is inside those COEs. So that's the idea of getting ownership of the different um, categories. Okay, perfect. So, so Pat, are you ready? So again, will the Army Reserve also look at those same nine fields of promotion for the tech branches in the Army Reserve? Yeah, I, I think I think Rick just did a very good job of clarifying. It's really nothing different than what we're doing right now in combat service, combat service support, MOSs. Um, the, the, uh, the identifiers that Rick is referring to we're already gauging and tracking as far as the um, ability to promote, if I understood General Watt's question, in the Army Reserve, that's going to be a key uh, key facet of how we move forward. Um, get the right names in the right spaces at the right rank and have career progression that involves moving and taking care of the people that do everything they're expected to do throughout the, the life cycle of a warrant officer is going to be the promotion model where we're adopting. In fact, we're adopting it now, but now we're target recruiting to make that happen. Thanks, Pat. Jonathan, this one I'm gonna throw your way for starters because it aligns with some of what you spoke to. As we advance in rake and different echelons, can the question is, can we be eligible for strategic PME, such as how the Army runs, command and general staff or the War College? Are those things that are being looked at in the future? 
Uh, yeah, so that that's a great question, and I think whoever um, uh, you know wrote that question because uh, very in insightful. It can tell somebody switched on there, and so we are exactly talking about that where. You know, we expect our warrant officers into the senior grade, CW4 and CW5, to be very technically uh, proficient and be a mastery of their technical uh, specialty. But then there's a certain level that uh, they start becoming more strategic, right? And not every W5 reaches that level, but, uh, but some do. And so right now, there's currently no additional education available uh, for those CW5s that move on beyond uh, that, that initial level into the strategic roles. And so what we're talking about is exactly what that, that person uh, mentioned is, is uh, you know, providing some courses like how the Army runs is a, is a great example. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to attend the uh, Senior Leader Seminar, another great strategic level mm -hmm. course um, uh, to 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 kind of fill that kit bag of that now strategic level leader. Although, you know, in our prior 20 some odd years, we were more, you know, execution level, you know, tactical and operational to kind of help bridge that gap into those strategic roles. So great question. And I hope I was uh, uh, clear on the answer there. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. And that was another one of those things with, uh, I attended, I was one of the first warrants to attend the brigade level uh, pre-command course out at uh, Fort Leavenworth, right? And that was really in interesting. I'm the only warrant in this room of 06s and SART majors. And at first I thought, what the heck am I doing here? But as we came to our collective exercise near the end of the, the, the training session, some of the things that we think of from our warrant officer foxhole really, I think, helped them to understand where certainly within the combat aviation brigades, the special forces groups, and other places, we're seeing our warrants being either senior warrant officer advisors or, in fact, command chiefs earlier. And, and, and we just don't have, we don't know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. And so having those kind of things, that was really, to, again, to Jonathan, thank you for that answer. Um, I'm going to go quickly on this. Will other branches be afforded the opportunity to go direct commission? I don't know where we talked about direct commissioning. We, we talked didn't. about, I think maybe they mean direct, oh, well, you aren't commissioned till you're two. So maybe yeah. that's what they're talking about, other branches besides special forces. Yeah, so I'm not sure if it's talking about direct to uh, commission officers, but if it is about the direct to CW2, that the short answer is yes, we are looking to do that because there's other appropriate uh, branches that, that might be a way to incentivize the senior NCOs to make that uh, switch over to warrant officers. Okay, hey, this last one, we're, I mean, I'm going to start a little early because it's a long question, and I want all four of you to please uh, walk us through this one. So the question is, how would you characterize the warrant officer of 2030 and beyond? Warrant officer competency and technical proficiency and warrant officer recruitment, assessment, development, retention, um, as it applies to the broader Army strategy. How do you compete with a dynamic and near peer, what's that warrant going, how do we get them ready for 2030? Cause it's gonna be here before we know it. Yeah, so that's a, that's something that's a, a talked about anytime we're socializing any of the uh, initiatives out there. One thing I, I would certainly add is if there's one thing it's clear for us as warrant officers, as a cohort moving forward, our time is, is in front of us because this is where our technical and tactical competency is going to really make a difference. We are getting more complicated, clearly, as we upgrade into the, uh, the future of cyber and AI and all these different things. We are certainly going to be utilized by the Army because of the fact that we are specific in our capabilities. And I think, I think recognizing that we're really, it comes back to even why we're wanting to uh, uh, look at uh, Title 10 changes because we're gonna have to move quickly on how we manage our warrant officers. Well, and that's why we're looking at improving all the PME because that is exactly why we need to do it because of the future. Yeah, Jack Dutille is, is winged on, so I want the Latin, you two gentlemen to please to take a moment. He says, please also discuss the importance as a warrant officer progresses through the ranks of broadening assignments within the branches, the technical expertise broadening opportunities versus the traditional officer with more of the broadening. 
um, outside of necessarily their, their career field. I think there are a lot of opportunities. We've got the training with industry and other things, but, but how does that play into that office, warrant officer of 2030 and beyond? Uh, John, if you'll take it, and Pat, you're going to close us out on those questions. Yeah, th thanks, Phyllis, and, uh, and and I appreciate that uh, prompting, Jack. Is uh, you know here here's the thought process in the past was a little bit about hey you know warrant officers need a, a broadening assignment you know about the W three W four level, uh, but the problem is is we uh, we broadened in a way that did not build depth right. Well, we can't really do that anymore. Um, we got to find those broadening opportunities, and your I trust me, your proponent is doing that. Uh, find those broadening opportunities that's going to continue to build mastery in your technical specialty uh, because the modernized army is going to require tech's technical expertise like it has never done before, right? We are no longer going to be able to make decisions based off of our gut. We're going to need data. Right, and we're going to need the AI to help us uh, cipher uh, through the data of, to find out what's important and what's not. Um, you know, our of course, you know what what separates warrant officers is, is three things, and I think these things are are even more important as we modernize. And it's it's coaching and teaching, it's mastery, and it's recruiting those that show the uh, skill and the will to be able to do what you're doing, right? Uh, and so if we do that, I think we'll be just fine. Uh, but we do have to recognize that we are at an inflection point to modernization and our PME will get left in the dust if we don't do something about it. And I know I gotta do a shout out to Steve Kilgore, the CAC CCWO, because I know he is championing this cause and and I just, just so everyone, and I'm sure everybody knows, but you know, I'm I am all in for this because Forcecom needs this. The you know the Army needs this, um, and so with that, I'm going to pass it over to you, Pat. Thanks, John. So let me just take another stab at this from a different angle. The future state for warrant officers to me means that these these current MOSs based on grade uh, and technical skill. I believe are going to get more refined and we're probably going to see more MOSs emerge. I'm a medical maintenance uh, warrant health services. I can fix x-ray machines. I can fix lasers. But as medical records have evolved and gone electronic, there's a whole subspecialty medical informatics that in my arena could be a completely different warrant officer MOS. So if we're going to make more warrants and we're going to become subspecialized, it's critical of what John was just talking about, the, the mentorship, the, the ownership of how the future generation comes into this and grows. And I would submit to you, you know, in the old days, they used to have apprenticeships where you had a master and then a, a, a newly trained, and there was a certain rite of passage X amount of years where the apprentice would learn the master's skill set and then become a certified master. When we started this go around with W-5s, we had master warrant officers. But more importantly, as you experienced, Phyllis, when you were in and went to Huachuca and saw that these brand new soldiers had literally more skills and more technical experience, I would submit to you that mentorship is going to have to go both ways in the warrant officer cohort of the future. So we have these masters, like uh, our, the seasoned group you have as panelists today, implying and implementing best practices, uh, philosophical, warrant officer broadening type of thoughts, but it's the young ones that are coming in that are highly skilled and, and, and dealing with the most advanced systems and they have to keep us green and teach us, even though the PME is changing, there's still something to be said about the skill sets and what this generation that's coming in has that we didn't um, from both, you know, the video game perspective and they're not technologically uh, scared to learn new things. So that's where I think the warrant officers are going to evolve. We can't be calling ourselves technical experts if we're obsolete. So the mentorship's gonna have to go both ways. And, and again, I believe there are going to be much more warrant officer specialties than we currently have. And thank you. Wow, there's your prediction, folks. We could keep going. There's so many more questions. We could have fun for another hour, but sadly our time is up for this session. So I just wanna thank all of these 
an incredible panelist for sharing their insights, their wisdom, and hopefully we have 100 people I'm seeing as attendees. Hopefully you're getting something out of this as well, but I'm gonna now turn it back over, sir, to General Haley uh, for some closing comments. Yeah, thanks again, uh, Phyllis, and thanks again to all of our panelists. I mean, what a great discussion. I know uh, personally I've leaned heavily on warrant officers uh, throughout my career, and hearing these senior warrants discuss these issues uh, makes me confident that the next 103 years are, are going to be very bright for our warrant officer cohort. Before we part, I'd like to inform you of a few upcoming events. On uh, the 21st of July, we will host a thought leaders webinar with a panel discussion on holistic health, featuring General Retired Bob Brown, Lieutenant General Walt Pyatt, Lieutenant General Scott Dingle, Lieutenant General Retired Patty Horaho, and Colonel Deidre Tehan. On 22 July, we will host a noon report on Army Women in Tech, featuring Major General Maria Barrett and Miss Nancy Kreidler, sponsored by Ernst & Young. On 3 August, we will host another noon report on Army Climate Strategy and Action Plan, featuring General Retired Bob Brown, Lieutenant General Walt Pyatt, and Miss Amy Foreman. And the AUSA annual meeting is back in person this year. It takes place 11 to 13 October here in Washington, DC, and we look forward to seeing you there. With such great speakers and events scheduled, I hope you can join us either for an upcoming webinar or in person at AUSA's annual meeting. For more information about any of these events or to register, please visit our website at AUSA.org. And one last event we want to highlight is the Army 10 Miler, as AUSA is a founding and co-lead sponsor of the race. And as part of the race, Chief Wilson would like to share and spotlight the CW5 team. Thank Chief. you so much, sir. Yes, so for about five years now, we fought because I saw that there was actually an E9 only group of teams. And I thought, well, there's got to be a way for us to have CW5 teams that run. We only compete amongst ourselves with other CW5 teams. So for five years now, we have had a number of W5 teams on the Army 10 miler that finish out within our group, uh, first, second, and third place. The first few years, it was always those special forces guys. And what can I say? But the intel is running strong. So here's the challenge amongst that I'm putting out there on the floor to all of you. So the W5s in the house, either currently serving or retired, form a team, up to eight people per team. Get them out there and running. We've got 93 days before the Army 10 miler. And, uh, and let's see who finishes strongest out of all of our Army Strong CW5 teams. And for those of you listening that are not yet at the W5, just know we do have enough W5s to fill out a number of those teams. We still run, we're still going strong. And as you prepare your career to make it to CW5 as well, we encourage you to also keep these teams going strong into the future. Also, as an AUSA senior fellow and a board member, I wanna thank all of you who support us with your membership because membership truly matters to us. And you help us support the Army and I just want to thank all of you and our incredible panel for attending. And I hope you all have a great day. And don't forget, tomorrow is what? That's right. Happy birthday.